Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Tehoon King. John Mason. Kevin Delgado. And Ray Chang. And welcome back to Our Way of Life by Sad Pie Enterprises. Last episode, me, Ray, John, and Kevin have spoken and touched upon the different cultural holidays, foods, and the traditions of the Korean American community and their own communal culture spanning their home country back east across the Pacific Ocean and their current homes here in the United States. In this following episode, we will better inform you, our audience, about the different cultural and traditional practices and delicacies of another particular Asian community, less prominent and more obscure here in the United States, known as the Japanese American or Nisei group here in the United States of America. Please, ladies and gentlemen, sit back, grab a snack, and enjoy our newest episode as we together take a deeper look into the Asian customs and cultures to clear away the different misconceptions that surround our communities and lead to the most prominent racial stereotypes directed against this particular culture. Now, bring the spotlight closer to the local Japanese communities here in our great state of California. And to start our discussion on the particular history and the heritage or cultures of Japanese Americans, it is admittedly important to look into the immigration story and the different troubles that they have to share. So what did this Japanese American immigration story and troubles look like? How did it begin? How and when did the majority of these Japanese Americans American immigrants migrate to the United States. What challenges did the Japanese American or Nisei communities face when settling their lives here in the States? Mr. John Mason, would you like to give us some input on this question? Yes, there were several factors that came into play, which uh, sparked like the first wave of Japanese Americans, which was during uh, the mid 19th century and who followed the first Chinese American immigrants and were later followed by the first Korean immigrants. Uh, The Japanese people, similar to the Chinese and Korean people, experienced much economic and social upheaval. Back in their home country of Japan, it resulted in several conditions that lowered like the standard of living, including things such as overcrowding or poverty and limited economic and social opportunities for many Japanese citizens. This combined with the booming of industrialization that demanded more cheap labor pushed the Japanese from their home country and pulled into the United States, particularly for those seeking better economic opportunities and better lives in general. These Japanese immigrants were known as the Issei or the first generation since they constituted the first wave of Japanese ever migrating towards the United States. And so it is quite self-explanatory. Anyhow, these immigrants would have occupied similar positions as laborers in uh, Hawaii sugarcane fields and California farms, and also working in railroads and mines for low wages, similar to the upbringings of the Korean and Chinese immigrants. Further immigration would be facilitated by an 1894 treaty signed between the U.S. and Japan, granting the Japanese immigration rights. Yeah, so... Uh, adding on to this, um, like inevitably though, as struggles that the Korean and Chinese immigrants both faced, uh, the Japanese Americans would also face the difficulties of uh, what is growing anti-Asian sentiment in the United States, uh, which basically draws parallels and uh, echoes uh, like the same fate of the Chinese immigrants who uh, par- who had partaken in the ca- in the California Gold Rush. Uh, we see the beginning of this most particularly with the 1907 Gentlemen's Agreement Act in which the United States sought to curtail immigration from Japan by making an informal negotiation with Japan and desegregating San Francisco's public schools uh, or a specific, uh, um, what was called the Oriental School was established for all Chinese, uh, Japanese and Korean students to attend specifically. This temporarily um, so the Japanese government's outrage for segregationist and unfair treatment that Japanese Americans were receiving. Um, in response to the Japanese government's outrage, 
Further efforts were made by the United States uh, President Theodore, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who was elected in 1901 and who sought to establish a positive relationship with Japan. Uh, he even uh, commented to Congress on the Oriental, Oriental School and saying that, uh, and I quote, to shut Japanese students out from po um, the public schools is a wicked absurdity. Um, this was evident in his actions, like playing a role in ending the Russo-Japanese War from 1904 to 1905 with the Treaty of Portsmouth and its arrangements of the tour of what was called the Great White Fleet, basically a herd of ships resembling the immense naval power of the United States at the time, which was to have a stop in Japan out of goodwill. However, despite such efforts and despite the gentleman's agreement, which was Japan and San Francisco's uh, Board of Education uh, and followed and acknowledged, um, the agreement was never ratified by Congress and it was never, uh, it was not successful in ending discrimination towards Japanese immigrants and attacks and protests towards them and their businesses were still frequent um, occurrences. It only went further downhill from here as Japanese immigrants were faced uh, with a series of more anti-Asian immigration policies like the alien land law passed by California, uh, which prohibited uh, those considered alien citizens from owning land, thus taking the property away from Japanese Americans and the Immigration Act of 1924, uh, which further restricted Japanese and other Asian immigration by enforcing a strict national quota system. Yeah, so all of this certainly, certainly served to inflame the Japanese government and raise their sentiment against the United States. But many tensions between Japan and the U.S. sparked, especially with the aftermath of World War I. So, for example, when the Allied nations gathered at the Versailles Conference, uh, the idea of creating what is called the League of Nations was proposed by U.S. President Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson in order to establish, as he put it, a world safe for democracy. However, despite it being his idea, the U.S. never joined the League of Nations um, since the U.S. since the majority of the U.S. Congress um, voted against it, and uh, but other nations like Japan did, and this had the effect of confirming Japanese suspicion of the U.S. And as a result of this suspicion and betrayal felt by some. And being a nation that was more lacking in terms of development, we see the Japanese becoming increasingly expansionist with its uh, conquests in China, which concerned the U.S. And inevitably, in order to ensure a strategic advantage over the U.S. in the case if they did try to stop them from, per from pursuing these conquests, and Japan uh, launched the well-known and unexpected attack on Pearl Harbor. This attack would shape the experiences of Japanese Americans throughout World War II, as the US government under President Franklin D. Roosevelt would sign an executive order demanding the forced removal and in incarceration of over 100, 120,000 Japanese Americans in internment camps. These internment camps were really poor in condition as their design was based on military barracks and were built very quickly. Throughout many of these camps, 25 Japanese people were forced to live in spaces that were meant for only four people, which contributed to extreme overcrowding and gave each person um, no privacy. And overcrowding, however, was only one of the many problems that these internment camps had. So uh, rooms in these camps were equipped with little insulation and wood stoves in cold weather and poor ventilation was provided in times of hot weather. And uh, this crowding uh, that I talked about uh, also caused a rampant spread of different diseases like typhoid, dysentery, and smallpox, and different illnesses that were in high prevalence like food poisoning caused bathroom facilities that were shared by so many people to be very unsanitary. This, uh, this forced relocation of the Japanese Americans to these unbearable internment camps would also result in Japanese Americans challenging Executive Order 9066, which put them in place. A small number of Japanese Americans, however, were also were able to avoid internment by seeking refugee in other areas outside of designated military zones where they found employment and sponsorship from different individuals and organizations. But for the vast majority of Japanese Americans who were relocated to the internment camps, they engaged in acts of resistance 
protest and civil disobedience to assert their rights. But before eventually being forced into internment, Japanese Americans um, actually also took part in such demonstrations, though uh, this uh, Executive Order 9066 was ultimately upheld by the Supreme Court. And one of the most well-known of these individuals is Fred Korematsu, who challenged the constitutionality of the executive order by refusing to comply with the evacuation order that was put that was enforced, and which resulted in his arrest and conviction. And this subsequently also resulted in the Korematsu v. United States court case at the Supreme Court. And though the majority of the court justices held the opinion that Japanese American internment was necessary for protection against espionage and sabotage during the time of war, and the decision of upholding Japanese internment was widely criticized for its endorsement of racial discrimination and violating civil liberties. Decades later, this court case would be overturned in 1983, and in 1988, U.S. President Ronald Reagan would compensate and apologize for Japanese internment uh, survivors by signing the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which provided these survivors and their families financial reparations. Okay, to add on, following World War II and the devastating internment that the Japanese Americans had to suffer with throughout the war, uh, the U.S. embarked on a comprehensive effort to rebuild relations with Japan through several initiatives that would impact the experiences of Japanese American immigrants for the better. First of all, uh, in 1965, the Immigration and Nationality Act, also known as the Hart Seller Act, was passed, which abolished the national origins quota system that was established with the 1924 and established a new immigration policy based on family reunification and skilled labor, which then resulted in increase in U.S. immigration from Pacific countries like Japan that will contribute to the growth of Japanese American communities. Many of these Japanese immigrants who became known as part of the Nisei and Sansei, the second and third generations respectively, would settle into urban areas and those who survived internment would work tirelessly to rebuild their businesses, churches, and cultural institutions, which were all aided by organizations like the Japanese Americans Citizens League in San Francisco, which promoted the cohesion of Japanese American communities. Japanese Americans also tried to uh, integrate themselves back into society with some downplaying their cultural heritage and assimilate it into an Americanized identity while others and to embrace the cultural identity and work to preserve Japanese values and traditions, efforts done by different Japanese artists, writers, and activists. Alongside trying to integrate back into American society, some Japanese Americans took part in the civil rights movement from the 1950s and 1960s in advocating for equality, justice, and an end to racial discrimination and segregation. In doing so, they collaborated with other minority groups to challenge such policies and laws that facilitated the persistence of these issues. Uh, probably one of the most prominent of these individuals was no other than Yuri Kochiyama, who was actually experienced firsthand the injustices of Japanese internment during World War II alongside her family. Her experiences with internment discrimination fueled to take on an active role in advocating various social justice causes like that for African-American civil rights, Puerto Rican independence, and the rights of political prisoners. She collaborated with prominent leaders like Malcolm X in advocating for Black civil rights and has been an important voice for Japanese Americans alike. And her powerful activism serves to inspire many activists today to take up similar causes of social justice. Thank you, Mr. John, and also Mr. Ray, and also Mr. Kevin, for the input. It's very interesting to see how um, important, especially, of a role the Japanese Americans had to play during the, I would say, three most iconic and also probably the most influential events that shaped the United States and also its particular history uh, during the... 20th century of which would have been the first world war the second world war and also the civil rights movement of which surprised me <clears throat> anyways so discussing the unique immigration story of japanese americans and some important individuals 
we are now better able to understand the histories and the stories that built up the Japanese American community here in this country. And to wrap up this conversation and build upon a now more profound understanding of the Japanese immigration history, I wanted to ask the question I had in the back of my mind while we were speaking here. Who are some of the more modern but still equally prominent and individual i mean influential figures of the japanese american community in our country as of the present day what exactly did they do for the development of our country and society and how are they viewed today in our society mr ray and mr kevin would you have some input for us here well throughout the vast immigration history of japanese americans there have um, been uh, there have been several individuals who had had significant influence on American society through their work, whether that be activism, the arts, or different fields of study. But we see many of these prominent figures within the latter half of the 20th century. And for the sake of time, uh, we will discuss three of these most prominent individuals in particular. Mm, yeah, so I would like to start uh, with one of the um, first of these prominent individuals who is uh, none other than Daniel K. Inouye, who was a trailblazing politician and a distinguished war hero who um, himself volunteered in the 442nd Regiment for the United States, um, which was a segregated unit uh, that constituted of primarily uh, Japanese American soldiers. Um, it's within this context of uh, World War II that he exemplified the power of distinguished bravery and leadership through his courage and his determination on the battlefield, even losing his right arm in combat. Um, from his active role in service in World War II, he uh, also became the first Japanese uh, American to serve in the U.S. Congress and became one of the most influential senators in the nation's history in advocating for uh, the principles of uh, justice, um, equality, and public service. Um, alongside Inouye, um, is uh, Patsy Takemoto Mink, who was also a prominent politician and a leading advocate in women's rights. Just how Inouye was, um, you know, the, the first Japanese American to serve in the U.S. Congress. Uh, Mink was the first woman of color in the United States Congress and uh, has made several advancements towards civil rights for Japanese Americans and women alike in her efforts, uh, like co-authoring the ninth uh, title of the Education Amendments of 1972, which prohibits gender discrimination in education programs funded by the federal government. And uh, one more equally significant individual with these two politicians is Mine Okubo, who was a pioneering artist and writer who was well known for her depictions of daily life and humanity. She was another of the many Japanese Americans who faced the suffering of internment during World War II but she stood out from the many and that despite the difficult living conditions, she continued to pursue art and eventually helped found the Tenforan and Topaz art schools, where she taught art lessons to children, adults, and senior citizens. Perhaps uh, her most famous piece of work was her graph memoir, Citizen um, 13,660, uh, which documented the experiences of her family in the internment camps in California, Utah, and such works brought light to the many injustices that Japanese Americans face within and outside of World War II. Uh, wow, thank you, uh, Mr. John and also Mr. Kevin and Ray. That's a lot of input, especially for a community that we often tend to overlook in our daily lives today. I mean, it's so interesting and also so... I would say proud and also slightly emotional to see all these Japanese Americans take <clears throat> the lead in leading our country today as politicians, artists, and so many others. <clears throat> Anyways, after going through the journey of Japanese American immigration heritage and learning about some of the most prominent Japanese American individuals today. I wanted to ask you another question. How would learning about the history and culture of Japanese Americans and providing an educational outlet on Japanese culture lessen racial tensions between the Japanese and American communities today? Mr. Ray Cheng, uh, I would like to ask for your input. 
on this certain question. Okay, so learning about the immigration history of Japanese Americans and their culture uh, alongside their history, which we will, uh, and, and their culture being the subject of what we will be discussing in our next episode has the mo has utmost importance in widening our views and expanding upon our horizons to the Japanese American community. From Fred Korematsu's resistance against Japanese American internment to Okubu's pioneering art and literature, Japanese Americans have played a have undoubtedly played a huge role in shaping American society as we see it today. And it is important that we acknowledge not only these immigration experiences, but also the significant contributions of Japanese Americans, as we do for all other racial minorities, so that we can further appreciate what they have collectively and individually done for the development and progression of our so so society. By developing this appreciation and awareness, I believe we can work towards building a more integrated and altruistic society by understanding the, this beautiful diversity and complexity within all of our cultural and racial backgrounds and how that contributes to the wonderful mosaic we have here in America in the face of modern racial issues today, like the COVID-19 crisis that has not only affected Chinese Americans, but other Asian minorities. Perhaps the best solution we have in facing these issues lies within the unknown power of learning about the many racial minorities in our American society, which can be an effective tool against the greater evil in discrimination if we all choose to use it in our benefit. Thank you for, <clears throat> thank you for the input, Mr. Ray. Uh, you are absolutely correct on that. Well, it looks like this is all the time we have for today, folks. So... Thank you so much for listening to today's podcast. This has been your hosts, Tihoon King, John Mason, Kevin Delgado, and Ray Chang. And you were listening to Our Ways of Life. We hope you have a wonderful day, evening, or night, wherever you are, and whenever you are listening to this. Have a great rest of your day.